America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. President, you have a quorum. Let's see, find out where We have a quorum. We do. Do we have a report on uh, action taken in closed session? There was no action, reportable action, taken in closed session today, Mr. President. But I did want to just uh, extend our sympathies to Trustee Gonzalez Yen, who isn't with us today. He's out ill. Uh, thank you. Is there a move to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Is there a discussion? Any changes to the agenda? There being none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstentions? Nays? Yes. Chancellor? I'm sorry, I know you're not pulling anything, but there is a resolution on the agenda this evening. We may like to speak to that. I would suggest that it be pulled. <laughs> can we do that? No? Uh, yes, we certainly can. This is the resolution. Well, there's a resolution on the agenda this evening that we may want to emphasize? Uh, Mr. President, uh, I'd like to pull, I guess, no, agenda item number nine Thank for you. the board's consideration as an action item. All right. <clears throat> Have that item number nine, which is consider approval of a resolution uh, supporting Oakland uh, Vegetarian Week. Thank you. We have a few speakers this evening, Mr. President, communications from the public. We have three speakers, uh, members from the public. We have Molly Sealand, followed by Matthew Lanza, and then June Ann Cook. And we do have a public speaker at item number two, the Sunshine Proposal with SDIU 1021. Your name, please. I'm the Classified Senate President at Merrick College. I'm also a Senator on the Peralta Classified Senate. And I wanted to take a minute to thank Chancellor Ortiz, the College Presidents, Vice Chancellor Gerhardt, and Twee for coming to our event, uh, Classified Matters, on March 27th. It was very well received by the classified ranks. Uh, hadn't happened in a long time. The workshops were well attended. Um, we are very encouraged to produce more of these workshops, especially in line with accreditation standards uh, for human resource development. So we look forward to more participation from the presidents and the chancellor, and thank you for encouraging us to be better at our jobs. Thank you, Ms. Sullen. The next speaker is uh, Matthew Lanza. Still on? Okay, good. Uh, good evening, members of the board, Chancellor Ortiz, Vice Chancellors, Presidents, and Associated Staff. I'm Matt Lanza, the SEIU 10 to 1 field representative. <clears throat> and in the vein of what Molly just spoke to, classified matters, uh, I'm here to renew the call from SEIU 10 to 1, um, sort of in this broad discussion that we're hoping to continue and, and broaden and further about classified staffing levels here at Peralta Community College District. Um, it's that wonderful budget formation time of the year when all of my compatriots and business services and the districts I served are pulling their hair out or have done so already or are just incredibly frustrated and overburdened. That was not a slight, I apologize. Um, and so in that vein that we're looking at budgets and formu formulating budgets for the next fiscal year, uh, I'd like to reiterate you know, the theme of March 27th, which I was unable to attend, but I heard from many of the 150 plus classified members or classified employees who attended and were uh, just effusive in, in their praise of it, that um, we really take a look at as a district, you know, we've discussed, you know, administrative levels and you've heard James speak on this, you've heard me speak on this as well, but also looking at student success and the correlation and what we have found to be a direct correlation between classified staffing levels and student success as uh, 
in, not in a means of sort of displacing or undermining the work that administrators do and faculty do in obviously creating and sustaining student success, but that classified are just as crucial in that matter, whether it's working on IT problems at the colleges to make sure that the students have internet or access to the various programs they use, whether it's making sure the bathrooms are clean or that there isn't mold growing in parts of the campuses. Um, it's imperative and, we, and we're calling on the board and staff to look at student success ratios to classified staffing ratios and see that this is a manner, this, this is a place where Peralta can continue to make strides. We are in sort of a new dawn here in this district um, in terms of our leadership and in terms of our economic footing in a situation we haven't been in in quite some time. No longer, we're going into negotiations and we're not looking at fighting off furloughs and layoffs for the first time in a long time. It's quite exciting for the union rep and me. And my hope is that the district can recognize and remedy that these deficiencies in classified staffing levels, um, the negative effect that they have on the quality of student education, and we can work to rectify that and remedy that. Um, again, we've talked about staffing numbers and about a month ago when I spoke, I handed a bunch of documents to everybody and I'm sure everyone took them home and read them fervently. But the classified staffing numbers here in Peralta is about 28% of the FTE and the statewide average is about 35. Some places, Los Rios Community College District, which has four campuses like ours, um, 35%. So we're hoping to, to get prove, just wrap up, Mr. Lanza. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, that through this analysis that we hope the, the board and the district does that as we increase our staffing levels, you'll see student success skyrocket. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is June Ann Cook. Hello, I'm one of those older students, but young at heart. Lady President, um, I'm a member of the American Association of University Women of Haver Castro Valley. I travel from Castro Valley to Berkeley City College to Laney College. Um, right now, I would like to actually praise one class that I'm taking right now at Laney College, and it is Human Values and Ethics. I love the class. I got a chance to email and talk to my uncle, Dr. Harold D. Fuller, um, about being my role model in my family. And as I talked to him, I, I told him I, you know, being an older student, I'm a little disappointed because I'm mentoring someone younger. Her name is Malaysia Owen. She's president over the Black Student Union at Berkeley B BCC. And as this young lady tried to be a leader at ASBCC, she's been under a lot of stress. As we finally um, actually get the funds that we put together at Black Student Union Day, I think it was March 5th, um, got a lot of runaround. Her dad had to pick up the check and get permission from, her from his daughter. Um, I just thought that after talking to Malaysia and letting her know, this is a young girl I've been mentoring since she's been 10 years old. She's down 19 and she goes to Berkeley City College and Laney College. She's doing just fine. But I just think the runaround of political administration, um, politics, as well as the ASBCC politics is so un unnecessary. I majored in international relations at San Francisco State in, I believe, 82. I had my master's from John F. Kennedy University in 2005 in sports psychology. I'm a filmmaker and photographer now, and that's where I'm going to Peralta College. I do want to say that I enjoy my education in Peralta College, but I do would like to see a change in the unnecessary politics. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 
there's no more speakers from the public, but do, we do have uh, a speaker on item number two, which is the uh, CAU Sunshine Inn of their. Uh, yes, before we do that, let me backtrack and ask for a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Nays, abstentions. We'll proceed now to a public hearing. There's no gavel that I see in the vicinity, so we'll just say I'm He's gaveling in. Uh, yes. <coughs> uh, gaveling in a, a public hearing on sunshining of the initial proposal for contract reopeners for SEIU Local 1021 to the Peralta Community College District, and I believe um, Vice Chancellor Alargent, um, this is your. Uh, thank you. Um, the uh, reopener proposals for negotiation with SEIU 1021 and a separate proposal by the district with SEIU 1021 uh, was sunshine at the last board meeting, and this item is on the agenda today uh, to comply with the government code requiring public uh, comment opportunity. Thank you. Are there any comments from the public? Did I'm sorry, did we open the public hearing? Yes. Okay. I didn't hear the gavel, so. Uh, I, I, gave, I gave it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, thank Mr. you. Mr. President, we have a, a, a speaker on this item, Matt Lanza, uh, for this item number two, please. All right, thank you. I'm back. Um, <clears throat> so my, the purpose of my speaking on our sunshine is not necessarily to speak on the substance of the sunshine so much as um, a request in and a, I guess a general statement as we go into bargaining. We have reopeners on wages and benefits, which um, are huge issues for our membership. As everyone knows, health benefits rates continue to skyrocket as uh, these health, in health insurance companies continue to um, increase their rates almost double digits every year. At the same time, January 1, the uh, Social Security payroll tax went back up, which um, even if it only, even only going up 2%, tends to negatively affect lower wage workers in a much greater manner than it does higher wage workers, and lower wage workers being many of the folks I represent, not just here at Peralta, but all throughout the East Bay. Um, and as, as I alluded to when I spoke before, we are in a significantly better economic situation as a state and as you know, a public entity than we have been for years. And it's in and of itself, it's a victory that I'm not dreading going to the bargaining table thinking about who we're going to be serving layoff notices to or how many furloughs we're going to be taking. And the hope is that while there's still a long way to go for Peralta to reach a fiscal level where we are um, stable and able to withstand a lot of the, 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 the craziness that can happen, that the shared sacrifice of the membership in SEIU 10 to 1 is taken into mind. And I have no doubts no doubts that Vice Chancellor Largent has that in mind as we go to the table. Um, as I'm sure she would say, we have a very good working relationship in terms of working together on negotiable issues. And my hope is that that percolates up as well as down. And that, you know, as gas prices continue to rise, as many of our members' property taxes increase in part because of the parcel tax that our members helped to pass. Um, as I mentioned, this, the payroll tax increasing as well. Um, the Prop 30 taxes, which only really apply in the sales tax in, um, instance, but again, those taxes tend to affect lower wage workers greater than they do higher wage workers as a proportion of their income. That the shared sacrifice over the years, the furloughs, um, the layoffs are kept at the forefront of the district's mind as we enter negotiations, and I look forward to hopefully a, an amicable and relatively short negotiation session this year. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there further speakers? Uh, no other speaker cards, uh, Mr. President. And then at this point, it would be appropriate to close the session. And so the session is uh, gaveled to a close. Thank you, Abel. Maybe a little more vigor, but <laughs> it'll do. Uh, now we move to reports, and we'll hear from the Associated Student Government uh, representatives. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Ethan Creasy. I am the ASBCC uh, student body president. Um, 
I'm happy to inform you that we've been meeting consist consistently, uh, and we have sponsored many events, uh, including um, a Persian celebration, a kickoff for Raise the Wage um, this today, actually. Um, we've hosted uh, many hikes for our hiking club and a series of movie nights. Um, we will be hosting an Earth Week event, um, a showing of a fierce green fire, uh, which is actually be spo being sponsored and um, developed by our AS. Uh, we will have a guest speaker event for the African American Culture Club, uh, along with um, recently we've successfully, uh, successfully worked with our administration on getting um, more uh, outlets in our LRC so that students have greater access to actually um, bringing their computers there. Uh, and we're working towards establishing scholarships for our students and are out of um, the AS. And we also have assembled an eight-person team that we're going to be sending to the SSCCC convention uh, later on in April. Uh, we're excited about that. Um, and we've paved the way for the new AS by writing and uh, writing and getting approved a new constitution for us to put on the ballot for the spring election, along with uh, we've scheduled the debates for um, our, the spring elections for the new AS coming in. And we are preparing a um, leadership retreat for once they get elected, we will help uh, teach them of uh, some of the responsibilities of, that they will be having in the next coming year. Thank you. Are there fur further speakers? There being none, <clears throat> we'll move to uh, reports from the Chancellor. Uh, thank you very much, President Galassa. I um, just briefly, since our last meeting, wanted to share with, with the trustees and our uh, audience that on April 1st and 2nd, we had our scheduled follow-up meeting by the Accreditation Commission. We were graced with the presence of four visiting teams, one for each college. The teams spent uh, Monday afternoon here at the district interviewing several of our staff, including myself and including um, Vice President Guillen from the Board of Trustees. And of course, their job is to come in and um, validate the <coughs> progress reports that were submitted by the colleges on um, March 15th. <clears throat> on uh, Tuesday the 2nd, the uh, visiting teams went out to each individual college where they provided uh, <clears throat> similar activities with the, the college president and the college administration, constituency leaders, uh, et cetera, again, in an effort to validate the reports. On the exit interview that I was um, privileged to have with those uh, visiting teams, um, in my estimation, were very positive, a positive experience, not only with the district and the three recommendations that pertain to the district, but also with each of the colleges and the recommendation that each college had to respond to. Of course, uh, now the reports from these visiting teams will go to the commission which they will then uh, consider in their June meeting. They meet twice a year in June, around June 6th and 7th. I'm not exactly sure what date this year, but they will meet in June and then make a final assessment as to the accreditation status of our colleges. And that should be available to us, if not uh, the end of June, certainly by early July. Also, uh, it's been mentioned by our uh, representatives from 1021 that we had uh, actually a, a staff development day for classified staff on March 27th. That was a, a staff development day for college-wide staff. And as, as Matt has mentioned, the turnout we thought was, was um, great with regards to um, the classified staff and 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 I my hats are off my hats off to the union leadership, but also to the classified Senate leadership, particularly um, James Blake, who uh, worked very hard in getting that to happen. And uh, 
since our last meeting, I've also had an opportunity to meet with uh, Superintendent of Schools in Alameda County, Sheila Jordan, where she and I discuss uh, the, the partnership that we want to pursue when, with regards to Proposition 39. You may recall Proposition 39 is that uh, sustainable energy uh, and energy efficiency proposition that was voted on in uh, November and uh, talking about how we are encouraging the governor to create a training component to Proposition 39 that will help not only develop a workforce that's going to um, be used to retrofit some of the facilities, particularly in our educational institutions, K-14. Um, and then finally, I um, want to uh, I want to uh, recognize the district-wide student, not the student government, a student uh, council that uh, has been meeting with me on a regular basis. We're trying to meet every month. We just met last week, and uh, maybe uh, Trustee Clegg or Cervantes have some comments, but I just want to share with the board that it's a very positive experience for me. It's an opportunity for me to hear from students what their issues are and what their concerns. And also it's an opportunity for me to be uh, transparent with students, which is what uh, I think is very important that we set uh, as, as a Peralta culture where we are uh, not afraid to speak truth to power and to share and be respectful of each other uh, in what we're trying to do, which is to create a positive experience, a positive teaching and learning experience for our students at all four colleges. And I am um, grateful for the opportunity to meet with students. With that, uh, ends my report, but it's an opportunity to launch into a college report from uh, the College of Alameda, who has a uh, aviation program and that uh, they are going to be pursuing a grant, and I'll ask Dr. Jackson to uh, provide a synopsis on what that grant will be. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, College of Alameda has the opportunity to apply for a grant. It's under the state of California, the California Community Colleges, and what they're calling it is doing what matters for jobs and the economy. So our new chancellor of the system is really looking at economic development. And as part of this grant, the intent is to target investment in emergent technologies. And there have been 10 technologies that have been defined under the grant rubric. Um, one of the ones that we're looking at applying for is in global trade and logistics. That's one of the sectors. And it aligns with our ATLAS program which is our Alameda Transportation and Logistics Academic Support Program. Uh, that grant ended in February uh, this year. So this will pick up where that grant ends. And one of the key points is that we would be a, what they call a deputy sector navigator. That's the new terminology um, that's being used in workforce development, which means that there will be a sector navigator for our region, and we would be one of those subgroups. Uh, transportation and logistics on the global side would be one of those subgroups. Um, and we would get, if we are successful, about $300,000, and that would begin for one year, July 13th of this year until, excuse me, July 9th of this year until July 30th of next year. So we are anticipating being successful. There is no other uh, individual within our region that is applying for that. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that we will be successful in getting that grant. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. And that concludes the uh, Chancellor's reports this evening. Our, uh, you may uh, have an opportunity to look in your Dropbox for the college reports. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to President Galassa. Uh, thank you. And uh, with that, I'll call on a board of trustees to, for their regular reports. And uh, Trustee Withrow will begin over there. He's going to pass. And Trustee Cervantes. Yeah, I'd also like to thank the Chancellor for meeting with us last week with the Peralta Student Council. Um, the two main topics that we talked about is um, communications in the district 
and then our advisor position. Um, the student spoke earlier about some of the frustrations. I know if we, um, there were four advisors at all four schools, some of those fr frustrations would not um, occur. Um, and the next meeting will, will be held at um, April 18th at the College of Alameda from three to five. And then also I'd like to report that um, elections are taking place um, May 6th and 7th. Don't quote me on that. Um, so um, all the student governments are preparing for elections. And then also um, all four schools this, this semester will be going to the SSCCC conference. And that's the first time I remember in a long time that all four schools will be attending this. And then also both student trustees. That's it. Trustee again. Uh, just briefly, Mr. President, I have been um, involved in the course of the last several months, just conversations. The community have talked about this before. I think Trustee Cervantes talked about, or, about this at some point, um, about the fact that many of our uh, community members, many of our students have been involved with uh, uh, or, or been uh, involved with the tragic shootings here in Oakland. And I'm really hoping that uh, here at Peralta, we can uh, take a leadership role in uh, trying to address this issue. Um, obviously, we very much care about the health and safety of our students, but in talking with uh, church leaders, tar talking with um, Oakland police officials, um, there's a need for us to figure out how to strengthen the pipeline between uh, our students, uh, particularly the administration of justice program and the um, administration of justice program in, in uh, filling the police academies, for example, there's a big need to try to uh, service uh, or try to make sure that Oakland residents and residents from our community college district actually uh, apply for those police academies and go into those, um, uh, those, um, those professions uh, that protect our community. Um, I've talked to Bishop Bob Jackson about this, folks from OPOA, uh, other individuals, and uh, I'm really hoping that at, at Merritt College, maybe the, if other trustees are interested, uh, have um, a discussion about what we currently do and how we currently partner with uh, the other police academies in our service area uh, to, to fulfill that purpose. I know we have a great program, uh, and maybe this is a, a conversation that we might be able to obtain, maybe a written report, if not a discussion uh, at the board level. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I just this is an announcement on uh, next Thursday, not this coming Thursday, but Thursday, April the 18th, 2013, uh, at the Lake Mary Breakfast Club. Uh, we'll be featuring our, our speaker that morning will be Chancellor uh, Ortiz. And for those of you who would like to come, it's at it's 7:30 a.m. in the morning. It is at it's in the lake it's in the Lake Merritt um, Park area. It is the Garden Center, the Marsha Corpru uh, building, which she was a former Peralta trustee. Is that right? mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're looking forward to uh, Trustee Ortiz. Chancellor. Uh, Ortiz. What, what is it? Trustee. Trustee, you got a, a promotion, Chancellor. Yes, thank you very much. I do appreciate that. <laughs> Largely, I just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chancellor Riley. Well, anyway, let me go. Chancellor over Riley, yeah. So, it's, so, <laughs> so, so next Thursday, the 18th at 7.30. The Garden Center. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. And of course, we all know that the earlier you get up in the morning, the better person you become. Yeah. And you can so have seven, and you can have breakfast that early. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to say thank. I want to thank the Chancellor for meeting with the District Wide Council, and he has brought in. Um, a new beginning and he is um, changing the culture of how he uh, the students have been um, um, interacting and so we do appreciate you coming out to speak with us and answering all our concerns and questions um, and you do bring clarity and we really like that about uh, you coming to meet with us I also want to thank Adela who has been has taken her job very seriously and has taken that position and she's running with it. Sure. If the student has a question or issue, she takes care of it immediately, whether she's in a meeting or not. And the students want to say thank you for that and they really appreciate you being here at Peralta. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Brown.
Oh, I just want to say her office is in the administration and records just for the public so you'll know where she's located. Thank you. Thank you, President Galassa. I'd like to just make an announcement and um, basically thank the chancellor and the staff for working on the outreach to um, area businesses. The chancellor has organized a seminar on how to do business with Peralta, which will be Thursday, April 11th, from 1 to 3. And um, that will be, let's see, what is just give you the location, the Peralta District Boardroom. I think it's a wonderful thing that the Chancellor's doing. I'm very proud of him and the staff to make sure that Peralta's outreach to local businesses is something that is um, well uh, attended and, um, and that it's an opportunity that we can make sure is embraces our entire community so that the education and the, the job skills and the talent that comes out of this this college district can cycle through the community in terms of economic empowerment for the people of, um, that live within the Peralta district. So thank you very much, Chancellor Trustee Ortiz. And thank you, what was the time of that meeting again? That is Thursday, April 11th from 1 to 3 p.m. at the Peralta district boardroom. Uh, thank you. And Trustee Handy, did you know, you're skipping. All right, and I'll just make a, a very quick comment. I wanted to um, uh, thank the uh, college presidents. We have them here tonight uh, for their hard work in the going through the accreditation uh, drama and uh, for your hard work in putting together uh, the reports and, uh, and to uh, have a constructive and very positive, apparently, from what the chancellor said, visit with the, uh, the team. So thanks, and we're all looking forward to uh, what happens in June, is that? Uh, okay, thank you, thanks again. I also would like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Lanza for his report as a former negotiator. I can appreciate the, the, the feelings that you're experiencing right now with a positive uh, confrontation is the wrong word, but a po <coughs> very positive uh, meeting, thanks. And that's it for trustee reports, and we move uh, to uh, District Academic Senate report. Dr. Van Putten. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and good evening, trustees. Chancellor, District Administrative Center staff, college presidents, colleagues, and members of the public. One recurring theme in these reports to you is the changing expectations of potential employees in the emerging global marketplace. You've heard my comments about the increasing importance of computer literacy for student success, the need for curriculum redesign that fully embraces educational technology, the effect of automation and robotics on the prospect of full employment, and the realization that, quote, many of the new jobs require skills that job seekers do not have, end quote. Tonight, I will add one more factor to this evolving equation the growing need for professionals with competency in languages other than English. Most recently, we've seen evidence of increased attention to this need amongst educators in the K-12 system and higher. For example, a recently published strategy paper from the Center for Digital Education entitled Graduating Globally Competitive Workers, Language Learning Gives Students an Advantage in Today's Workforce. A link to the site where you can download this report will be included in the written version of this report. The report is based on a survey of over 100 leaders in K-12 and over 100 in higher education. These leaders were asked whether training in a second language and multiculturalism was needed to remain globally competitive. The report states, quote, an overly resounding 97% of K-12 and 96% of higher education respondents agreed with the statement. Despite that almost universal agreement, at least among those respondents, 
we are aware that language learning in the United States has been on the decline for at least two decades, if not longer. In this nation of immigrants, it is estimated that approximately eight in 10 Americans speak only English. Contrast this with the fact that, quote, 200 million children in China are studying English, and every educated child in India learns English, end quote. Added together, those numbers are greater than the entire population of the United States. The most obvious implication of this disparity in multicultural language competency is reflected in a 2011 Forbes Insights survey finding that one in three American firms would be more likely to fill more or significantly more key positions with foreigners by 2013. At the same time, we're hearing more in the news about resistance to the use of H-1 vis visas and the fear that foreign nationals are displacing American workers. That fear and resistance might be lessened by a greater awareness of the global need for workers to have multicultural language competency skills and the dire need for American schools to develop and expand effective language learning programs throughout the K-20 educational system. Fortunately, if we have the will, it is abundantly clear that advances in technology make it easier and more efficient to provide these programs. Of course, that requires an infrastructure and sufficient mobile technology resources to support student learning anywhere and at any time. These needs will make increasing demands on our information technology systems and will require additional funding. There is much more that can be said and needs to be said about this topic that will be saved for a future report, part two and possibly part three yet to come. That concludes my report for tonight. Thank you for your attention to these comments. Thank you. And now we move to a presentation on open educational resources, um, abbreviated OER, and reducing student textbook uh, costs. This has been something that the board has been interested in a long time. We've had several reports and attended several uh, local meetings, and uh, so we're looking forward to the presentation. Uh, President Galassa, I'd like to introduce Vice Chancellor, uh, Acting Vice Chancellor, Interim Vice Chancellor, uh, Michael Orkin, any of the above, uh, who will present this item with faculty member Fabian Banca. Uh, greetings, uh, Board of Trustees, members, colleagues, and community. Um, so tonight, as um, was announced, we're going to talk about open educational resources, which is part of a broader picture that includes uh, such things as open source software, which allows uh, people to develop software and use applications without paying licensing fees. For example, at Peralta, our website platforms are done in WordPress, which is open, an open source platform, our distance education, um, operation is done using Moodle, which is an open source platform. And my colleague here, Dr. Fabian Banga, who's the chair of the Modern Languages Department at Berkeley City College, has been a pioneer at Peralta, not just in open educational resources, but in open source software. It's Fabian who um, led the charge to have Moodle be our open source platform and also helped me in, um, with our WordPress. Um, um, installations, and I think as a result of Fabian's work, we've Peralta has saved um, a great deal of money and has made um, development of some of the uh, communication tools that we use to communicate with the community and the public um, uh, much more democratic and um, accessible to all uh, members of our uh, of the Peralta community. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Fabian, who is um, going to talk tonight about open source, about open educational resources, namely um, in uh, ways to have textbooks or online educational resources without having to pay enormous costs. So Fabian. Hello. Well, I will prepare this uh, very broad presentation and uh, I was thinking that I can talk for like 15 minutes and then we can open it and people people can talk uh, then we can all talk about these technologies uh, as uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Orkin said uh, 
op open uh, resources here at Peralta is nothing new. We are experimenting with these technologies for quite some time. Um, Sometimes uh, there are cases that we are not recognized of what we did here. Um, when the government is talking about bringing OER to uh, California, uh, many of us sometimes say we are already doing this for a while. Uh, so we welcome these, these, these uh, approaches to the technology. So um, just to say, uh, th there are things that we are doing already here, but uh, at, at the uh, state level, uh, there are some organizations that are investing a lot on these technologies. Some cases are based on, for example, the use of resources in books, even if there are discussions on you know, approaches to open education, which is actually a broad uh, philosophy. Uh, examples of, uh, I mean, symptoms of coming from these phenomenons, you can see in, not only in the development of new technologies, but discussions in areas like MOOCs, for example. You can, you can open the New York Times every Sunday, you will find an article about MOOCs. But the problem is that sometimes uh, people don't understand exactly what these MOOCs or these open resources applications are. Uh, I think it was a month ago we were in Sacramento with some of the trustees were there. Yeah, in general, and we were talking about MOOCs, for example. And so all, all these phenomena came from the same kind of philosophical <laughs> approach of the use of technology and, the, and how to use this technology pedagogically. Uh, in 2008, uh, some people started to get together and say how we can put these theories together. And, and a, a great book that is actually is open source, you can find it in the MIT Press uh, website, is called Open Up Education. It's a book that I, you should actually have in your library. And they are all intellectuals around the country thinking about how we can open education. Because the, the issues that we are confronting are so severe, and the technology is growing so quickly that probably a presentation that I give you today in a month will be obsolete. Uh, however, there are issues that we are confronting, and we are confronting in the classes, and one of these issues that that's why uh, my Chancellor Hawkins asked me to, to come and talk about is the price of books. So if you go to the 20 million mine website, it's actually 20mm.org, you will find tons of stuff about this. But it's a specific area when they talk about uh, the, the issue of books and how expensive they are. To give an example, for example, I teach Spanish 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. The student has to spend probably between 200 and 300 dollars per class uh, per semester. So this is, this is a lot of money for some of our students students that even can pay, for example, the BART that they came from San Francisco to here. So, and they find out in these, these people in the 20 million mine organization find out that actually one of the main reasons why students actually drop the university is the price of, of books. Uh, they find out, for example, that between 1986 and 2004, the prices of books rise 186% which is, is unbelievable. So this means that if I actually invest all my money that I pay for my house, uh, probably 10 years ago, if I could invest that money in books, today we have two houses. This is, this is unbelievable. This, is, this type of corruption is, oh, the issue is, 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 is unbearable. I mean, uh, so we, we are teachers, we are not, we are not an economic. We, we, I don't know how this happened, but we see it every day in the classroom. They also, in, in this study, they find out that 80% of all textbooks that we use are part of the same conglomerate controlled by the same press. So it means that 80% 80, 80 of all the books that we use are controlled by five companies. Um, they said, for example, that it's so bad that uh, at community colleges, textbook comprise up to 75% of to the total cost of the school, that uh, the total cost of this, what the students pay for education. 
so just to, to move quickly on this, uh, an, an estimate of how much a student pay uh, per, per year for two semesters is around $1,600. Um, there is another study by the Bureau of State, uh, the Bureau of State, of State Audit that completed in 2008 that they support these ideas. If you actually want to see this, this, this report, and I will not go in details, you can find it in the URL that you see right there. It's interesting that he said also that the increase of the publisher's invoice price or the price of the, the publisher charge retail is, is actually minimum. It means what actually the, what, what our bookstores gain from this book is minimum in comparison to what actually the people that create the book uh, gain. This is another chart that can just, uh, sometimes this graphic uh, can be more shocking than numbers. And you see that from 1998 to 2008, the price went 812%. Going back to the joke of the house, if you see the color is actually in orange, it went only 325%. So what can we do? Well, we, we are limited in this area because the only thing that we can offer from, from the instructor's perspective and the, and the researchers is know how to deal with economic. But we actually can propose a solution that came from the intellectual power is actually that, that they are the OERs. The idea of OERs in books is actually no well separated from the idea of open source of open education. For example, the principle that we use for the learning management system that we use right here today, Moodle, is the same concept. I will create an application, or we are, I will create an idea, or an artifact, and I will give this artifact in a way that nobody can own it. I mean, we can all use it. Actually, you will give me credit. You will say, oh, Fabian created this part of the application. But I, no, one, no one can own that application. Uh, this principle that is not new, this is actually from the beginning of time when the, the internet was based on Unix, is the principle of cooperation. It's like we are, we are part of humanity. If we don't save each other, we are going to die. That's, that's a very simple thing. Sounds very idealistic, but it's very brutally sustained by fact. If I have a person that control 80% of the resources of the community, the community die. So when, when people start to talk about OERs, or open educational resources, in general they are talking about artifacts, videos, ideas that they are offered to the community and they are not controlled by anyone. Interestingly, in, in these last two months in Sacramento, they start to talk about legislation and ideas and, and bills. And actually, the SB 1052 and the SB 1053 are two examples of this. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go in details on this. I gave Roxanne the, the language of the bill, and you can actually download it from the website uh, where the agendas are. But uh, in principle, the idea is that the government will support this, these books. The books will be completely free. Uh, students can download it in artifacts like this. For example, I wrote these two examples. This is a candle, and this is, and this is a, a tablet. This is an Android. Both of them will cost approximately $100. Students can navigate the internet. You can download your book. You keep it. So as I said, actually this is not new to us. I will show you some examples of what we're doing right here. In, Ber in Berkeley, uh, I mean Berkeley City College, we created a site where we actually will archive all the information that we use for some specific classes. If you see the website and click on student resources, you will see that there are resources for mathematics, 
English 130. And let me show you the Spanish because it's the one that I know better. So you click in there, and you have an archive <coughs> of materials that the student can use by chapters. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the first week, I'm talking about the verb ser, for example. The student just click here, and I go to a site that actually offer materials on, on that subject. This material is completely free, costs nothing. We can download it, we can print it. It's for everyone. Even you can actually, I'm sorry? Do we have audio? Oh yeah, let me show you some of the, let me see if I can go back. Since we want to mess with the chancellor now, let me show you something that we are doing with another class, Spanish 38, which is a literature course. And in this course, we decided this semester that we are going to offer the course free to anyone in the planet that want to actually follow it. So if you click here, for example, you can see videos from writers. We don't have audio here. literaria estaba recibiendo una información de tipo histórico de tipo político y en un is in Spanish because the class is in Spanish but uh, we actually we don't only use material that is are available on the internet we create the material for example this one short story that we are reading about Puerto Rico and so we want to interview people about you know this island in the Caribbean so suddenly wow we have a chancellor who is from Puerto Rico so what I do took a camera, cornered the chancellor, and asked, could you give me 20 minutes to talk about how was your life in, in New York? I'm not giving this to just be nice with the chancellor, but just as a good example of something that we are doing right here. So I will go and interview him. Tecnología a veces no nos juega en contra. So, bueno, estamos aquí con, el, con nuestro querido chancellor. Del, and we will go and talk about you know, his life in New York. So for our students, this is extremely important because it's not... Tenía bastante, mucha familia en Nueva York, mucha de, de, de mi, la familia de mi, de mi mamá, eh, precisamente mi abuela. Anyway, poor chance, I don't want to put him on. But, uh, but, uh, but for us, this is, this is, this, this doesn't, this is not something delirious, so, so something I have the chance I want to do a video, but this is actually the spirit of all we are. When, when you buy something, we said in regular classes, what you do is you buy the video. In OERs, you create the video. You know, in, in regular classes, like for example with MOOCs, what we call the X MOOCs, that they are more classic, like what Coursera is doing, the instructor create the video for the student. But in the C MOOCs, what is actually closer to open education, actually the students actually do the video. And the, the instructor loses a little of the control of what is going on. And that's good. Otherwise, we keep doing the same thing. But for example, this video, I, I'm reading a short story about Puerto Rico, and, and I want more material about this short story. I want to change interviews, I want to interview the chancellor. I have the video, I put it on YouTube. This is completely free. Anyone in the planet can use it. So that's what, how we are creating this artifact. And we know that this artifact will replace books in the show. I mean, I'm talking about a couple of years in the future. The idea of the book like this is dead. This book printed like this are obsolete. They are already obsolete, okay? And, and we are paying insane amount of money for something that is, is too primitive. So, so when, when, you, when you have all these artifacts and you wanna put it together for a class, you are not only helping your students, first of all, they don't pay anything, it's completely free. They sh in general, the story is free, it's already on the internet, so they can download it. If they want to print it, that's fine. They put it in a USB file like this, go to anywhere, for $15, they have the print. But not only have they have the print, they have the video, they have the classes. For example, every single class that we teach, we record the class. And we have to be in compliance with, you know, many different 
elements, like for example, it has to be captured. Uh, if there is a visual component, it has to be described for students with special needs that, for example, cannot see or, or hear, but they have to be there. It, this is not that simple. It's not just record a video and put it online. But for example, if I, if I go to my class tomorrow, I'm not the only, I'm showing the stuff that I have. Doesn't mean that I'm the only one. There are several instructors here in the district that they are already doing it. But if I'm talking, for example, about this writer, Juan Rulfo, who is a Mexican writer, I record the class. So I'm recording the class. And this is kind of brutally, this is what it is. What do you think? What do you think? It's available. We don't have to buy it. Actually, for example, sick, cannot come to the class. They can actually hear the class from home. So this is not the future. This is the past. This is already going on for quite some time. The only problem sometimes we have is that the point instructor have to teach 15 units, go home and correct for another 15 hours, and they don't have the time to do this. So. But what we see in from Sacramento, some institution is sometimes institution come to support these ideas with resources. I don't know. This is something that has to be discussed. But but the idea is already there. We we don't need the books. We we, we could actually avoid this idea that the students have to pay two thousand dollars per year to buy books. It's absolutely, we don't need that. That's ridiculous. I'm not using in my thirty eight. I'm not using books since two thousand and six. I'm not the only one. There are many instructors like that. But some subjects actually are much more complicated. For example, in languages, it's more difficult. You need specific book. Well, we can create this book. And when we create it, anyone in the planet can use it. Uh, in Sacramento, that with this legislation, they are trying to create a, what we call a free library. For example, they will get this group together and work on a book on <coughs> physics, for example. When that book is done, it's available. We cannot impose this to the instructor. I cannot go to the department and say, use these books. No, that's academic freedom. The instructor don't want to use it, no. But maybe they, maybe they will. And pretty soon there will be so much material available that we don't have to use this, this stuff anymore. And I, that's, I conclude with my part. If you have any question. No question? Okay, questions, Trustee Abel, and then we'll go to Trustee Brown. Um, so is, can you tell us what percentage of our faculty have actually embraced uh, sort of uh, this policy of no textbooks and kind of going to OER? Our we, we don't know. We don't know. I don't have a number. You don't have a number? We could actually do an you know, assessment and find out who is doing it. In general, the instructor will just decide it by the First time I know someone in Laney that has his own book. It's a PDF file, the student can download it. We are doing languages, in mathematics in some areas, but I don't have a number. And, and what, what institutionally uh, is the district doing, or is it by college, to sort of support um, this type of te technology? Because I, I see this as not only is it good for our students, but um, actual recording of classes. And I don't know, there may be something in the contract there with, with this stuff, but. The recording of lectures, I think, would be uh, as a staff development tool for other professors to maybe who are teaching the same subject area to kind of see and kind of get feedback from one another as to how they're they're doing on a particular subject. Um, you know, I'm not sure if, if that's being employed at this point in the district, but if um, you know, we know that students self-select uh, instructors in many ways, and uh, I'm wondering if this sort of uh, these tools can be used as a way of uh, uh, for staff development. Sure, actually, there are. Um, we have to be uh, careful. Um, there are some precautions. For example, I cannot take a camera and record my class. So it's actually a, an issue of privacy. I don't want to put the students on on the internet. You know, it's kind of wild. However, for example, with the audio, it's different because the audio. Oh, you just can, with the audio. That's right. I, recording the audio. Uh, nobody can identify who is talking. But actually, in my case, I'm putting myself as, you know, as, as a speaker. But uh, if the student asks a question, the student is not identified. These are all little details. Uh, but for example, 
uh, a similar concept that you're offering about recording is that uh, the, the technology that we have in the, in the classroom right now, it will allow, for example, if someone is teaching at Laney and someone is teaching at BCC, they can talk to each other through video conferencing. So then that video could be recorded. But, uh, but this is something that we can, uh, I, I cannot give any opinion about that. It has to be the decision of the instructor. There are law and, and stuff that they have to be assessed, and, and I, I don't know. Well, what, yeah. um, sort of tangentially to, to that, um, educational technology is sort of seeping in and f sort of starting to appear in various places. So it may not just be the entire textbook is uh, suddenly becomes um, faculty generated or faculty and student generated. But um, for example, in the math area, um, some of these companies that are offering what are called MOOCs, a Massive Open Online Courses that we've talked about before, um, are free and some like Coursera maybe are a little bit controversial, but at the moment you can go on these websites and um, have free access to um, um, rather sophisticated software for problem solving. So um, I've been, my office has been recommending that um, and I think some faculty members at various campuses I know at Merit for sure have students who go to these other websites to have supplemental learning resources um, that aren't part of their textbooks that are free in which they can interactively solve math problems. The, the Khan Academy is another example of that where I know some faculty at Laney are, send their students to the Khan Academy. You just go to khanacademy.org, I guess, and uh, there's just a wealth of problems and software that allows you to solve problems into, um, in not just math, but in other sciences and also in humanities. And so these technologies are sort of seeping in to the traditional place where you would have to go to textbooks and do problem, solve problems and do problem sets and you get um, free um, explanatory material as well. Um, and there, there are also, other resources that, for, for example, just social networks like Facebook and YouTube. There's a faculty member at Ohlone who came out here to give a talk who uses Facebook groups to start discussions and do things with students interactively that um, maybe used to be restricted to faculty sitting in a classroom using a textbook. So there are these new technologies are just sort of coming in and um, starting maybe to erode the traditional textbook as learning resources. I, I just wanted to just say that I know that I think it was the Academic Senate President that gave us a, um, some information, or maybe it was Berkeley City College, but about contextualized learning and um, how that's been shown to improve our, our student success rates. So I'm hope that's that's incorporated into here also. But um, uh, one of the things that I, I see that we need to start moving towards, and I'm not sure if the colleges are planning for this, but uh, K through 12 is moving towards common core, common core standards in language arts and mathematics and other areas. And, um, and so I know that uh, for us, uh, and there's gonna be a technology component based to those common core standards, uh, how is that gonna impact us at the colleges? What are we doing to prepare ourselves for for um, those new standards and how are we um, sort of integrating with with those new new requirements down the pipeline? I, I don't think those are questions you can answer right now, but those are questions more for um, for the institution. Uh, thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Meredith. I wanted to thank you for your presentation and also thank you for putting on representing Peralta at the uh, convention in Sacramento in January on this very topic. And my question, one of the things that we were struggling with at the um, seminar in Sacramento was the um, timing and how to support the development of these materials um, so that they can relieve that economic burden that's placed on students by the cost of the books. And I'm wondering, we were not quite sure then because the legislative calendar had begun for um, in January and we, or with the laws that were being passed, and we weren't quite sure what the, what, what the rollout looked like. And we were also going through some of the legal issues that, um, with copyright and with ownership and, and that sort of thing. And I was wondering if you had any more information on how that uh, forecast looks. 
We're actually, uh, the result of that discussion is, is the C, CSB 1053 and 52. Um, the SB, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the SB 1052 and 53 is a way from Sacramento to try to support this idea. However, um, I think the technology going so fast that, um, that the way that we actually govern ourselves is not going at the same velocity. So for example, if we have if we want a solution for this, we get together, we go to these conferences, but when, when you get to a, a bill or something, the technology already move away from us, mm -hmm. and it's going so quickly. Um, the example of, we were talking about MOOCs, in the, and, and it get he, heated up because the person that was uh, our side was from Apple, mm -hmm. and it was always kind of, Knowing more, but uh, when we're talking about research, we want to move companies away from. Right. Uh, and she was trying to offer this application. She, they, they would not do this complicated presentation. She would give you a beautiful presentation with a perfect accent and nice pictures. And we said, this is the solution right here. You buy it. We are like, no, life is not like that. It's complicated. It's going so fast. So, but uh, but I, I, will, I will explore in the idea, for example, for the MOOCs. When people are saying that MOOCs will replace classes, the same thing that the book, I, I, I don't trust that. Uh, MOOCs are not classes. But they are great OERs. So we, we will not have one bullet, um, silver bullet for everything. But we'll be a little bit from everywhere. And in 10 years, things will be so different that the conversation that we have today will be obsolete. That's my, and so, sorry, it's a little catastrophic. But that, I think it, that's what, what are we seeing? Yeah. Thank Mr. You. President. Okay. And Trustee Withrow. Oh. Uh, I'd like to uh, segue from what uh, Trustee Guillen talked about in terms of um, uh, the degree we've penetrated the market, if you will. Um, some of us aren't as patient as we probably should be. Uh, how? do we communicate to the students, the prospective students, that uh, they can take a section that is, um, has a book that can be downloaded off of uh, the open domain onto their Kindle? How do, how do they know about that? Uh, yeah. what? It will be directly from the instructor to the student. That's how we, we don't do it massively. I'm not going, for example, to all the classes and said, all these classes will go and download this material. We do a one-on-one -on -one with instructor. So for example, they show up to my class and I said. So the student has to, the student has to go around and inventory? No, no, they come to the class and we said, you will go, uh, at the district we already have a learning management system that give a, a virtual classroom to every single class. So for example, if you get to my class, um, you will have an ID, a number, and a password. So you, you will log in in your shell, what we call. And in that shell will be just the instructor and the students. And in that place, there are explanations of what you should do. This is the universal. Every single student that we have at the district have access to Moodle. This is our learning management system. In that, the material is inside of that shell. So you don't have to go around and get a link from there or from here. In the same shell, all the material is in there. Okay. We also have a website, um, that two websites, one at Berkeley City College and then the district, on the district websites we have um, this website which is web.peralta.edu slash OR where we can promote um, open source or open educational resource materials and let students know in advance um, where such, which classes have such opportunities. Which sections? Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. And that's what that's something we're planning to do. And um, another, just a, a sort of a related comment, um, the whole notion of authorship is changing. And I think there's going to be a critical mass sometime soon. Um, a, number of, a number of years ago, I wrote a statistics textbook for a publisher, and it was a year-long project and took an enormous amount of work, and I wasn't particularly rewarding, and I didn't expect it to be in the monetary sense. It was satisfying from an academic perspective, but the point is it was a huge project, and it took an entire year. Um, a few years ago, um, a former colleague, Phil Stark, who's now the chair of the statistics department at UC Berkeley, wrote a free textbook um, that's online on the UC Berkeley website 
that's a statistics textbook that also took about two years to do. But now, with the new technologies, you can go in and put up on a, a blog or a website a chapter, a set of problems, some ideas, and the whole open source or open educational resource concept or paradigm means that a lot of different colleagues in a department or across colleges can participate in writing um, a book, but it, does, it isn't a huge project anymore. It'll just be things that are pieced together, such as what Fabian was talking about more in audio and video, but it can be done in text as well, in which you have these artifacts that get pieced together into a book. So I think that soon one of the things that's going to change the whole publishing industry is just the availability of technology to allow large communities of authors to put together a, a textbook. Yeah, actually, there is another. Maybe it sounds confusing because in the past, when you navigate the internet, you have to go and find stuff. For example, I want to know what is going on in Europe. So you go in every single newspaper. That way of navigating is gone. We use what we call syndication now. You will have an application in your computer, in your iPhone, and it will bring stuff from many different places. It will look like a book. It will be like just one newspaper. We use the same technology for the class. The students have to go and check this video there and there. Well, uh, Chancellor Orkin was uh, talking about in this website, this web website actually is not for a student. This is for an instructor. For example, I'm teaching Spanish 1A. I check, I'm looking for material about this specific topic. I click right here, and suddenly I will have a database that we created. Actually, it's our own database. And these have thousands of links to material. So the instructor will go and search and say, for example, I want something in French. Click right here, and immediately you see all the links that they are related to French. So the, the instructor click in there, see the material. This is fantastic. Copy the link, go to your shell where the students actually, it's like a, a small community, it's like a Facebook. And you put the link right there and said, this will help you with this topic. This technology is growing very quickly. It will be so powerful very soon that you will have it in your phone. You will be actually driving and stop in the red light and open your phone and just start to put links together. And that will be the class. Uh, that's why I was saying the technology is growing so quickly that we don't know what is going to happen. But we already start to see that this can actually replace books. And that's what we call OERs. Yeah, trustee again. Uh, I, I love books, still have many of my textbooks from college, and you know, there's nothing that replaces the flapping of pages and, and kind of ear-dogging them and whatnot, but uh, at the same time, I think it would be a worthy goal of the district to say, or to at least have one or a few programs that we can uh, matriculate students through without having to buy a textbook. Um, you know, what would it look like for us, for Peralta, to be able to offer transfer to whatever CSU or in line with the, I forget the build number, in line with the, some of the um, transfer uh, bills that, that have been introduced recently, but to say that, you know, if you want to be an English major or you want to be a psychology major, you can do that here, and guess what? You can do it uh, all online, and you don't have to pay for any books. That would be amazing and revolutionary, I think, for us to try to establish that, that goal as a district. Okay, I, I would like to make it. First of all, thank you for the presentation. It's very illuminating, and uh, having this kind of concrete uh, look at what's going on is much better than just a, an oral report. Uh, watching your program, your Spanish program, I think uh, was uh, was very, as I said, illuminating. Uh, when I earlier in preparing for the meeting, I did go on the site, the connection, kind of fiddled around yeah, there and say, "What the hell's here?" and uh, uh, I, I downloaded a book just to see how long it takes and so on, and it was Barbara Ilowski's uh, uh, Statistics for English Majors and Other uh, Non-Mathematical People. And so I have a couple of questions. It's a, it's a handsome book. It's got a lot of stuff in it. How does Barbara get compensated for all the work that she put into it? She's not looking for any compensation. We do it for just her people. I see. It sounds, uh, sounds, it sounds uh, weird in this kind of society, but there are people that spend hours and hours producing this stuff, and they want nothing at the end. And they are completely anonymous. Uh -huh. Many of them are completely anonymous. And many people here in the, in the district, actually, uh, I'm doing this since ever, we're working with applications. This is, this is the, origin, the origin of Unix. 
that's how Berkeley created the, <coughs> the, the component, I mean, the operating system that sustained the internet today. It was doing in the basement with people that they don't want anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just, they just talk and, uh, uh, and they, they are not looking for money. They just give it to humanity. That <coughs> it should not be revolutionary. Uh, it is. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. I do. Um, it, one of the th I downloaded lo loaded it as a PDF, mm -hmm. so I was able to okay. underline things and make notes to myself as going along, which was great because it's not that easy to do it on some of the other programs coming that you when you purchase right. a book from Amazon or something like that. That's why you, you can use it in Android or you can print it if you want. You, uh, yes, of course I could print it, but uh, uh, Roxanne won't give me enough paper to <laughs> print those books. <coughs> I had one last comment on it. This morning, in this morning's a, um, New York Times, uh, was an article on another advancement in online uh, books, and that is that uh, one of the major companies um, uh, has come out with software uh, that will allow the teacher to see and determine exactly uh, when the student opened the book and yeah. which sections he read and uh, the degree to which he either underlined or made notes it's to himself. Now, yeah. it's scary. Yeah. It's like a big brother. But then, on the other hand, as a teacher, if a student is failing, I'd like to know why. Is it me? Is it the book? Is it that he's not uh, working hard or whatever? Well, so what are your views on something like this? Or? Well, actually, we're already doing this with Imudo. Uh, when the student log in, we know at uh, what time the student log in, what application he saw, but we use it with with compassion and kindness. I'm not using it to. <laughs> to uh, uh, but if the students, for example, ask me, I don't understand this specific topic. You go and then because the student didn't log in to the, the site, so that's why. So you can give a better advice. But we're already doing this for quite some time. The instructor knows everything. How many times the student log in in this in the in the system? Everything. So can, can yeah. we get an application that allow me as the president of the board to determine how frequently um, oh, Trustee Riley, for example, yeah, if you opened give me the, up if you give the us documents? the resources, uh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much. There's a question from Brian. Yeah, I just um, went through Passport and looked up one of your classes, the Latin American Literature class. Uh -huh. But on the, on the bottom where it says textbooks required, it just says textbooks to be determined. Mm -hmm. So as a student, how would I know going in that I would need a computer to be able to even take this class? You don't have, in, in my case, you don't have, you need a computer because you can actually print it if you want. When you came, uh, for example, the first of all, I, I, we do an assessment. When the students show up, we say how many, if you have an application, many students use even phone to read it. But in case that you say, I don't have a computer, or I don't know how to use the computer, or I hate the computer, we will say, that's very easy. You just go to the copy center in the corner and print it. So what I do at the beginning of the semester, I take that PDF file and I send it to that store and several stores by email. So it's there waiting. So the student can go and just, uh, I think it's $15 for the book. Uh, furthermore, if he doesn't want to do that, or she doesn't want to do that, she, he, or she, he or she can go to the library and download it. Or That's why it's a determined. It will be extremely complicated to put in passport. So, um, but you know what? Uh, we actually even printed from our own packet for the students. Uh, it, it would not be the first time that the students show up and say, I cannot even print this. So we go to the basement, uh, we print it for them. Uh, it, 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 it would not surprise me. It, we, I'm not the only one there. That's what we do. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. <coughs> Uh, President Galassa, I would like doing. I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Banga for his presentation. I also like to make a final comment, uh, so you know that if I'd have known that the video he took of me was going to be seen by anyone on the planet, <laughs> I'm not sure I would have conceded to that. <clears throat> and then uh, the comment made by Trustee Gu uh, Guillen with regards to the Common Core standards. Um, we know that the K-12 system is realizing that in their common core, what they're doing is actually preparing the students for college. And they're trying to align their curriculum to what we do at, at, uh, at the college level, whether it's the community colleges or the uh, university system, as we have been 
uh, aware for many years that at least 60% of the students coming to our universities and community colleges are unprepared for college level work and the common core initiative is to try to close that gap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chancellor. <clears throat> and with that, we proceed to the consent calendar. And I believe we have some items that are going to be, or that have been pulled. I'm sorry. Yeah, Mr. Uh, President, uh, uh, would, item number 11 has been requested to be pulled for clarification. All right. Item number 11 is contract approval for lifelong medical care at Merritt College, and that was requested by Trustee Handy. And also item number 9, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Th uh, thank you. And with those items being pulled for discussion purposes, I Move understand. approval. All right. Second? I'll second. Okay. And uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Nays? Thank you. Uh, we proceed then to um, item number nine first. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to just pull item number nine, which is a resolution of the Proudsa Colleges endorsing Veg Week. And uh, I recently saw a movie called uh, Four Go Over Knives, um, which oh, we need a motion. Sorry. Can we have a motion for approval? I'll move it. All right. There's a motion. It's seconded. Got discussion. Anyhow, I just wanted to read a little bit about um, the, uh, just about the resolution. What it says is that uh, the Peralta Colleges endorse and support Veg Week in Oakland here, which is April, April 22nd through the 28th, and we're asking people to be um, vegetarian and not eat meat during that week. Uh, Oakland Unified cur currently practices Meatless Mondays uh, each week to introduce students to healthy vegetarian options and the benefit to the environment. Uh, here at uh, Peralta, we've established the Peralta Wellness Center uh, to try to um, instill in our students the, uh, the need for optimal physical, mental health well-being and how that impacts our student success. Um, but also that the uh, American Dietetic Association recognizes the, that reduced meat consumption de decreases the risk of various health problems. Um, stating scientific data suggests positive relationship between a vegetarian diet and reduced risk for several chronic degenerative diseases and conditions, including obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and some types of castor. And what this resolution says is that we endorse and support uh, Oakland Veg Week from April 22nd through the 28th and encourages students, staff, and faculty to participate in, ve in Veg Week and encourages our culinary arts program, restaurants on campuses, and food suppliers to provide veg vegetarian options and educational materials in recognition of this week. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is a motion on the floor uh, to accept this resolution. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposition? Abstentions? Thank you. Motion passes. And now we proceed to item number uh, 11, and I believe that Trustee Handy has some questions. Yes. Um, the way it's written, it's hard for me to... Uh, I'd like to move to approve item number 11. Sorry. Okay, discussion, okay. proceed. All right. And once again, for those just listening in, it's a contract with lifelong medical care for mental health services at Merritt College. Right. I'm trying to understand um, this. It says in the original contract with Asian Health Services, they were responsible for subcontracting with community agencies. In the end, it says that now Peralta will do the subcontracting. But what I'm not understanding, is this a new contract? Um, yeah, I'm not really understanding. I've read it like five times, and I'm still not clear what it is that you're asking us for. Right, so this was actually, Dr. Ng is still um, overseeing um, student health services, but this is actually, the way this is written, I'm not quite sure why it was written this way either, but um, Peralta will still be doing what it's been doing and subcontracting out, and this is just another um, contractor in addition to Asian Health Services. So okay. it's just part of the same. All of the, I think the way it has been set up with mental health services, all of the um, colleges have mental health service capabilities um, on their campuses, and Merritt needed a, a new contract. Okay. So now, okay. so Lifelong yeah. is now going to be providing the mental health services. To Merritt. And, but, but Asian Mental Health is still the um, contractor for our student health services clinic at Laney. That is correct. Services. That is correct. Okay, it just wasn't yes. clear. Yes. Thank I you. Know. Okay, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. 
Aye. Sorry, I believe that concludes uh, all of the items, uh, active items on the agenda. And with that, I will proceed. Do we have any uh, announcements? Just briefly, Mr. President, the next uh, meeting of the Board of Trustees takes place on April 23rd, same bat time, same bat channel. And uh, the board, again, would like to uh, extend our well wishes to our colleague and friend, Trustee gonzalez um, who is in the hospital. And that concludes uh, the announcements for this evening, Mr. President. Thank you. And that uh, concludes the meeting.